पर नहीं सोचा मर जाऊंगा तुझसे ये बिछड़ कर नहीं सोचा तुम मुझसे जयफी का सामान रहे हो तुम बाप से मरने की रजा मांग रहे हो अकबर तुम्हें मालूम है क्या मांग रहे हो बधाई मरी तुम बाप से मरने की रजा मांग रहे हो दिल रोता है नजरों से अगर दूर हो बेटा किस तरह जुदाई तेरी मंजूर हो बेटा तुम ही मेरी आंखें हो मेरा नूर हो बेटा मुझसे मेरी आंखों का जिया मांग रहे हो तुम बाप से मरने की रजा मांग रहे हो अकबर तुम्हें मालूम है क्या मांग रहे हो तुम बाप से मरने की रजा मांग रहे हो दुनिया से गया जिस घड़ी महबूब खुदा का नाना की जियारत को तड़पता था नवासा है लाल तुझे इसलिए खालिक ने था मांगा मकबूल हुई मेरी दुआ मांग रहे हो तुम बाप से मरने की रजा मांग रहे हो अकबर तुम्हें मालूम है क्या मांग रहे हो तुम बाप से मर खुदा सलामत है इस्लाम ये खुद अपना लहूरन में बहाओ सीने पे सीना शान से मैदान में खाओ तस्वीर पयंबर की तहे खाक मिलाओ क्या इसलिए मरने की रजा मांग रहे हो तुम बाप से मरने की रजा मांग रहे हो अकबर तुम्हें मालूम है क्या मांग रहे हो तुम बाप से मरने की रजा एक रोज तुझे आन के मांगा था पुपी ने अठारह बरस नाज उसे पाला था पुपी ने बेटों से भी ज्यादा तुम्हें चाहा था पुपी ने एहसान जो जैनब ने किया मांग रहे हो तुम बाप से मरने की हो अकबर तुम्हें मालूम है क्या मांग रहे हो तुम बाप से मरने की रजा मांग रहे हो बाबा मुझे मालूम है क्या मांग रहा हूँ एक बाप से मरने की रजा मांग रहा हूँ बाबा मुझे मालूम है क्या मांग रहा हूँ एक बाप से बाबा मुझे अम्मा ने भी कुछ दर्श दिया है 
آداب وفا سے مجھے آگاہ کیا ہے پہلے میں مروں آپ سے وعدہ یہ لیا ہے بس اس لیے مرنے کی رضا مانگ رہا ہوں ایک باپ سے مرنے کی رضا بابا مجھے معلوم ہے کیا مانگ رہا ہوں ایک باپ سے مرنے ہیں آپ تو بابا بن خاتون قیامہ اور ماں ہے میری ادنا سی ایک پہ کر اسما کیا سینے میں اس کے نہیں کچھ جذبہ اسما میں مادر مزدر کا کہا مان رہا ہوں ایک باپ سے مرنے کی رضا مان رہا ہوں بابا مجھے معلوم ہے کیا مان رہا ہوں ایک باپ سے مرنے کی رضا مان رہا ہوں حسین الغریب الغریب الحسین حسین الشہید شہید حسین آپ نے بدائی مرنے دعا کریں حسین الغریب الغریب حسین حسین الشہید شہید دعائی دعائی خدا را دعائی یہ دشت بلا میں ہے کیسی تباہی بہایا ہے کس نے یہ خون محمد قیامت یہ دھائی ہے کس نے الہی جوانوں بزرگوں کو مارا گیا ہے شہیدوں میں شامل ہے ننہ سپاہی حسین الشہید کیا جشن برپایو اہل حوث نے شہیدوں کو لاشوں پہ ڈنکے بجائے جلا ڈال آل محمد کے خیمے سکینہ کے مو پر تماشے ہیں مارے جو بیمار تھا اس کا بستر نہ چھوڑا نہ بیزادیوں پر بھی درے چلائے حسین الغریب حسین الشہید شہید اٹھی اپنے مرکس بنت محمد سیاشا کی چادر میں چہرے چھپا کر گئی کر بلا میں تو اس نے یہ دیکھا ہے بوسیدہ کرتے میں ایک لاش بے سر بدن سارا تیروں سے چھلنی پڑا ہے لہو میں ہے ڈوبا ہوا سارا پیکر حسین الغریب الغریب الحسین حسین الشہید تڑپ کر وہ چل 
लाई शबीर बेटा लहू में नहाए हो सर भी जुदा है तबर के स्ने मारे है सारे बदन पर ये तीरों पे रखा है किसने जनाजा कहाँ है मेरा लाल अब्बास बोलो मैं पूछूंगी उससे ये कैसे हुआ है हुसैन अल गरीब गरीब हुसैन हुसैन सदा सुन के जहरा की थर रागाजी जुदा तन से सर था तो शान कटे थे गमो या सुहसरत में मजरू है मुजतर कहे क्या के दरिया किनारे पड़े थे सुए अल कमा अब जो बीबी ने देखा वफाओं के साइल पे झंडे गड़े थे हुसैन अल गरीब गरीब हुसैन हुसैन शरीब इधर दर दो गम की सताई थी जैन जो वह शत के जंगल में है दर बनी थी कभी खा पुड़ाती कभी अष्ट पीती जो कुंबे के पहरे पे तन खड़ी थी सकीना की सक्का को आवाज देकर गम में शाहिदी में बुका कर रही थी हुसैन अल गरीब गरीब हुसैन हुसैन शहीद शहीद हुसैन हुसैन अल गरीब There is a word I was waiting for to see you there. Am I sitting correctly for the, the microphone and the films? And... There is no freedom left in this world, you know? <laughs> Big Brother is watching. Yeah. This is almost like something that one has to worship. Friends, good evening, and you're all very welcome, especially for those who weren't with us on the earlier three nights. Um, and also to our distant friends who are looking in. We actually have a little more time than normal this evening, so what I'm going to do is to uh, take the theme for the evening and speak about that, and then if there are any comments or questions or discussion that we want to have about that, then we'll do that, and then we will probably have a little time over, and already some people have come to say, uh, I've got a question, could you deal with that in this extra time? So I've got two or three questions already stored up and there will be a chance for other people to ask questions as well, all depending upon how much time we have. And Shemaz has got the watch, and so when she says stop, then we stop. Good. My nose is shining on the camera. <laughs> Sorry about that. Unless you have been living in outer space for the last three or four years, then you will realize that in Britain, 
we have had a very considerable crisis of leadership in our political life. And without wanting to go into particular personalities and details, I think we can say that that leadership question has not yet been fully resolved. Leadership is then a crucial part of the story of Imam Hussein. And it's that element that I want to look at particularly this evening. Now, some parts of the story we've already touched on a little over the last two or three nights. They've come up in different contexts. So let me just rehearse a little of that, especially for those who weren't here. You remember that we saw that in the life of the prophet, his particular uniqueness in leadership was that he was one subject to the law. He was one subject to the Quran. He was not like some of our worldly leaders who think that they are above the law and they can do whatever they want because they are above the law. But instead, here we have in the prophet leadership under the divine guidance. So he is the, the, the tool, the functionary of the Quran and therefore of Allah. He is not autonomous in his own right. Secondly, we saw the way in which his whole life was so filled with divine guidance, with divine light, that it becomes like a perfectly polished mirror. And on this mirror, the qualities of God are radiating upon him, and then they are reflected to us. Now, the mirror model is very important, again, because if you think of a mirror, if you don't shine anything on it, there's nothing to see from it. If you think of the moon, when we look at the moon and it shines brightly at night, we know that the moon itself has no light of its own. It is the sun that shines upon the moon. We look at the moon and we see that light. So that is like the light of the prophet. The qualities of God, the light of God, shed upon him, and he perfectly reflects them, so therefore we can see those qualities lived out in the human life of the prophet. That's why we saw that he was called the living Quran. If you have seen the life of the prophet, it is as though you have read the Quran. If you have read the Quran, then you know the quality of the life of the prophet. So the two go very much in partnership together but his leadership is derived from God who sheds that upon him. It's not in his own autonomous right. The third thing that we saw both in his life and in the life of the first Imams that we've looked at of Ali and Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein was that they also share in this divine light so that they are guided not just infallibly without error <clears throat> but more than that impeccably without sin so they are sinless beings as sinless beings they are capable of guiding us not just without error in their teaching, infallibly, but also without error in their way of life, because they are sinless. So we see then a characteristic of leadership in which it is not something I choose, it is not something that I get because I'm uh, the son of somebody else, that the leadership is by divine appointment. So when, in my teaching, when I'm talking about the Shia Imams, I always use the phrase, the divinely appointed Imams, so that we don't confuse them with the, the lad who leads the prayers at the local Sunni mosque, for example. 
so that people have a very clear understanding of the divinely appointed imams. And because they are divinely appointed, their authority is coming from God and not from them. It is through the ilham, through the inspiration which is given to them, so that they are rendered the purest, the best of creation. And you might remember last night that we looked at that verse that talked about going under the blanket or the kiswa, and only the pure can render somebody pure, only the purest can render a thorough purification. That's why the verse says, and I wish to purify you with the most thorough purification. And that is the whole basis then for the Ahlul Bayt, as the bearers of that purification. And then finally we see the way in which it is the responsibility of the Prophet to designate, designate is the word I use for Nas, to designate his successor. It is the duty of each Imam to designate their successor. Now this is not their own choice, that's the whole point of the story. They are the tools, the agents of God who infallibly guides them. Therefore, when the Prophet designates, that is, as it were, God speaking through the Prophet. When one Imam designates his successor, that is, as it were, God speaking through one Imam, designating the next one. So that we have this model of leadership from the beginning. Now I want to explore some aspects of that leadership. You will remember that in the time of Imam Hassan, there was a, already a tension within the community. Muawiyah was claiming power and so on and refusing to give his bayah to Hassan. And there became a political tension. And Imam Hassan agreed that he would step back from political leadership because he wanted to avoid the bloodshed of civil war within the community. But there was an agreement, you remember, and the agreement with Muawiyah was that he would not appoint a successor. In other words, the question was deferred. I don't want to get into the particular terms of that deferment because that's a fairly controverted area, and I'm not that clever. However, the agreement has been made, and it is Imam Hassan who dies before Muawiyah. Now, there was a time in the city of London when there was a code of practice. It was summed up in a very simple sentence. It said, my word is my bond. When I have said something, that is it, I will deliver. Even though, between saying and doing, the price of the shares might have dropped an awful lot, but I have given my word. Now, let's look at what Imam Hussein does then, when he inherits this situation. Because his brother has given his word in that agreement, that he will not challenge Muawiyah for power, provided that Muawiyah does not seek to appoint a successor. And he abides by that former agreement, my brother's word is my bond, <clears throat> until such time as Muawiyah breaks the agreement. So persevering in honour is part of the, the quality of leadership. And we've had a few examples in very recent world history when individuals think, I have the power to unilaterally withdraw from a treaty, for example. 
Well, all treaties are a waste of time if one party can just unilaterally tear them up. So there is a question then of honour and abiding by my word as a quality of leadership. <coughs> we know then that what happens is that Mu'awiyah appoints Yazid to take over as the leader of the community. Now, Yazid is the archetypal weak tyrant. A weak tyrant has to be a bully, because it's the only way that you can keep power. You have to intimidate people, and you have to pick off those people who could be opposition to you. So we know that what Yazid decides to do is to send out his agents to all the leading people within the community and to say, you have to publicly pledge allegiance to Yazid. And if you refuse to do that, then we will beat you up. And if you still refuse, then you might not wake up tomorrow morning. So this is the archetypal strategy of a weak tyrant. Go around picking on people and force them to pledge allegiance to you. Now let's look at it now from Imam Hussein's point of view. Because the community looked to Hussein as the grandson of the Prophet, even those who would not, we wouldn't use the word Shia, but of course it's rather early in history to use that term, but even those who would not recognize the imamate of the Shia Imam Hussein, nevertheless they recognize that he is the grandson of the Prophet, he is a spiritual master, he is one who is possessed of great wisdom, piety, and therefore authority. What would happen if such a man pledged allegiance to a man like Yazid? Well, if Hussein could do it, so can I. That's obvious. It would give carte blanche for everyone else. Well, if it's okay with Imam Hussein, it's got to be okay for me too. Now we see another quality of leadership, and that is being prepared to take a stand, not just for yourself, but for the sake of those who look to you. Because if the leader is weak, if the leader is corrupt, then we have catastrophe. There is that lovely phrase from Shakespeare when he says, the hand that holds the power is in itself corrupt. And therefore, there is corruption on foot throughout the kingdom. So he is on his mettle to stand firm because the eyes of all the, let's call them the ordinary members of the community, are looking to him for leadership. If he had given in, the whole story would be lost, because you have given in to a tyrant. Now, remember that we are looking back into the history, and we are looking forward also into our own times, because the, the messages, the teaching, the example of Imam Hussein is not just for the 7th century, it's not just for the Shia, it's not just for Muslims, but it speaks to all humankind in all ages. Therefore, it gives us an example of what to do when faced with a tyrant, what to do when faced with rampant injustice. Now, our rampant injustice might not wear a label called Yazid, but it might be well, there's a promotion going in the business, and we would like to offer it to you. And there's quite a bit pay rise associated with it. Of course, the job will mean that you have to exploit your fellow human beings. Now, it may not say that on the job description. But you know that well what it might mean. You are to get people into deeper debt, 
so that they are controlled. You are to sell them things, PPI insurance, remember? You are to sell them things that they don't really need so that we make money out of them. But there's a big salary. So here is a taste of modern day tyranny for little people, as it were, not just for great world leaders. And so we're looking to the example of Hussein to say, how can human beings learn to resist that kind of injustice and tyranny. Another characteristic. Let us remember that the, the home of Imam Hussein with his family is in the city of the Prophet in Medina. And he is told that the agents of Yazid are coming for him. So he gathers up his family and they move from Medina to Mecca. If they will not respect the city of the Prophet, maybe they will respect the city of Allah. And then we know that they're coming down to Mecca for him and that he leaves Mecca on the first day of the Hajj, the day before Arafat the most sacred day of the whole hard season. And we know as well that some well-meaning people were saying to him, well, you go, but for goodness sake, leave your family here. Leave your family in safety with us in Mecca. Now consider from Imam Hussein's point of view. Of course, he doesn't want to take his family out into the desert. Life will be very hard. There will be severe deprivation. But on the other hand, what might happen to them if he leaves them behind in Mecca? The agents of Yazid will come to them. They will be tormented. They will be persecuted. They will be abused. And whoever knows what else will happen. And so better to trust in God than to trust in the agents of Yazid. Because by trusting in God, he's going out into the desert. This is the right thing to do. Out into the desert we go, along with the women and the children. I want to give you a model now that you see Imam Hussein is one of those people who every time that he is asked to make a further commitment, makes it and then says, and now what? So, you know, if you're, if you're playing poker and somebody says, I'll see your bet and I'll raise you. So it's constantly he's being asked for more. He's gone from Medina to Mecca. He's gone from Mecca to the desert. And we see in the journey across the desert, constantly he is being asked to commit more. To commit more to what? To commit more in faith that God will stand firm and God will not let him down. That he will be vindicated. So it is a constant challenge of faith. Not of course just for Imam Hussein, but also for his companions, for his family, and we know that some of those who begin the journey in the company of Imam Hussein decide that they will go off, they will go away. So a test, uh, a test of faith, an ever-increasing demand is made and an ever-increasing response is made another quality of leadership and then people go off what does he do he doesn't say well if you go off I'm going to kill you I'm going to remove the whip and you'll no longer be a member of the party instead he is saying you're free you're free to go no pack drill you're free so freedom giving other people their freedom also seems to be a hallmark of the kind of leadership we're talking about. Not leadership by coercion, 
but leadership of free people who freely choose to follow. So another quality of leadership. <coughs> Let's look for a few other sidelights into the question, a few other people that help us to see this quality of leadership. Because Imam Hussein insists on sharing the deprivation of his people as they travel through the desert. You remember Field Marshal Montgomery during the Desert War insisting that he should be served the same food as his men, insisting that he should live in the same conditions as his men. How can I ask men to do something if I am not prepared to suffer their lot? Another quality of leadership. We know that in other conflicts, generals like to sit well out of the action playing cards while they send more men to die on the front. So a quality of leadership that we see then also in Imam Hussein. A couple of good British examples. We have here in London Guy's Hospital. The story of Guy's Hospital is very interesting because the Guy is a man, it's Thomas Guy. And Thomas Guy was a businessman who was notorious for being mean. If you went to his house, you had to take two overcoats because he was too mean to heat it. He would gather up old newspapers and screw them up to burn them in the fire. And everybody thought Guy was the meanest man on two feet. And what they didn't know until he died was that throughout his life, Guy had been saving all the money he possibly could to scrimp and save to found a hospital for the poor people of London. <coughs> so again, part of the quality of leadership is not trumpeting your actions and having a goal and being prepared to go at it. You remember again the story of the Prophet sending out Imam Ali to take bread to the hungry people within the community. Do not take a man with a trumpet to go in front of you so they all know you're coming. Go out at dead of night, leave the bread so that nobody knows where it's come from and who has done it. Now we see something of the quality of leadership. You remember how we saw that when the Prophet came into his, the company in his mosque in Medina, there was no place reserved for him. He sat on the floor wherever there was a space. There wasn't a gold chair, there wasn't even a gold cushion, or even a gold camel saddle. So, the quality of leadership does not promote itself, but serves the people. The quality of leadership sees a long vision ahead. Again, there was a young doctor called Alexander Fleming, you remember, working here in St. Mary's Hospital in Paddington, who comes across a strange phenomena. That is that when he comes back from his holiday, some of the bacteria on his Petri dishes has not grown because a mold has grown and has killed them instead. And from that one insight, he develops the vision to develop penicillin and for generations thereafter we have blessed his name for that work. <coughs> so a quality then of vision is also this long-sightedness. Fleming could not possibly have known how many generations would benefit from penicillin beyond his imagination. We're told, who knows who counted them, we're told 30,000 troops were arrayed on the field of Karbala. How many of them can we name? I doubt if we get above two or three. And yet we can name the companions of Imam Hussein, 
we can name all those who stood with him and died with him and here we are 1300 years later and their names live on in glory in a way that they could never possibly have imagined so a certain doing the right thing because it's right and leaving the rest up to God is one of the qualities of leadership that we're seeing I like the story of General de Gaulle de Gaulle was a soldier you know and like a soldier sometimes he had a fairly rough tongue so I'll give you the, the simple version de Gaulle was addressing the politicians of France and he said to them you give as much leadership to the people as a dead dog floating down the river now that's a fairly graphic image and we know that the great charism of de Gaulle during the war when the French people were absolutely backs to the wall was that he gave them that vision to struggle on against all the odds and to keep believing and then we have that image of the fall of Paris the conquest of Paris and de Gaulle leads the men like he was 10 feet tall and marches all the way down the Champs-Elysees to the Arc de Triomphe so there is something then that is bold that creates courage in the hearts of the leader and we see that again um, in Imam Hussein especially on the day of Ashura itself but also on the night before I think that night before is a most powerful night because you are given complete freedom it's me they want save yourselves head for the hills I'm going to put out the candle nobody will notice please go candle goes out time passes and the candle is relit everybody is still in their place we would rather die with the grandson of the prophet of Islam than we would save our lives how would we live with that disgrace afterwards but you were given your complete freedom so this quality of freedom in leadership is again I think absolutely central we'll push on and we'll look again at what happens during that journey through the desert now you know that he is sent for he's called by letters from the city of Kufa now these are the people who reneged upon Imam Ali he knew that they were fickle he knew that you couldn't rely on them <coughs> yes they were great supporters no they blew the other way so you remember that he sends his agent Muhammad ibn Akil that he should go ahead that he should take the temperature that he should measure the situation and then you know that he is captured he is executed he refuses to give up his faith in Hussein and a message comes back don't come for goodness sake don't come so he receives bad news and yet he presses on because he has a mission that is to be fulfilled so another part of leadership is what do you do when things turn against you what do you do when the going is rough and not smooth what do you do when you get bad news do you persevere or do you say I think we'll go and grow tomatoes and that also is an important lesson in our times now one of the realities of course of life is that we have a great shortage of leaders 
not just in the world around, but also in our own small communities. By definition, the Bora community does not have access to the Imam in occultation. Therefore, you do not have access to that infallible guidance that he could give until the day of his return. So therefore, there is a real tension there about where does the leadership come from and how does the ship not just stay afloat, but to move from a ship to being a train, how does it stay on the twin tracks? I have left with you two most precious things, the Quran and the Ahl al-Bayt. Well, the only answer that I can come up with particularly in the reformist community, must be that that leadership must devolve to every single member. Every single member must play their part in that collective leadership. Because there is no divinely appointed leadership whilst the Imam is in occultation. There are caretakers of the community, but that's not the same thing. So it seems to me that this quality of leadership that we're thinking about with Imam Hussein is not just talking about them as leaders, it's talking about all of us as leaders too. And that is the thought with which I would like to leave it. <clears throat> and so if anybody wants to come back with comments or questions or discussion, we had some very useful correction last night too. So comments, question, discussion or correction would be very welcome. So bored the life out of us that we've had enough of that. <laughs> Silence is golden. Whoa. Yes, it's the sharpening of knives as well. That's what it is. I'm afraid there's no time off for good behaviour. The committee have got the programme set up, and whether you like it or not. <laughs> we move on? Yeah. Right. Now, this then is however much time we're allowed. I can't see. Uh, there she is. Three. Oh, 15. Three. Oh, 15. <laughs> Three, that's good. Right, 15 minutes. That's until 9.30. Um, I've, got, I've got three questions lodged, and I'm going to take them not in the order in which they were lodged. And I don't need to tell you who asked the questions. The important thing is, what is the question and can I answer it? During these nights and habitually within the Shia community, we think about these great personages from the Shia perspective. And we have a very high esteem, divinely appointed Imams and so on. So the question is, how do the Sunnis approach and respect? the same personalities. First of all, remember that differences between Sunni and Shia are always a question of interpretation. If the text of the Quran was completely unambiguous, if the events of the life of the Prophet were agreed by everybody, then there would be no Sunnis and Shias, there would just be one single community. We know then that Imam Ali is regarded by the Sunnis as the fourth of the rightly guided caliphs. That is the best generation, the best 
age of the early Muslim community, of its leadership, and they speak of four rightly guided caliphs. And Ali is one of those four. Therefore, they have the highest esteem for him. However, there are some tensions in the pack because it is in the life of Imam Ali that the first civil war takes place within the Muslim community. And so already then there is a tension. And the tension is whether or not Ali sufficiently prosecuted, went after the assassins of the Caliph Uthman. Now, Uthman, you may remember, was assassinated by an Egyptian. And the Sunnis generally divide the life of Uthman, of Uthman into two sixes. He was 12 years Caliph. The first six, they say, that he was very much on message, living and teaching and working according to the guidance of Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. But in the last six years, a degree of nepotism began to creep in, and he started making appointments within his family and within his clan. And it was that sort of thing that led to the Egyptians being somewhat disgruntled. And in the end, it was one of the Egyptians who was responsible for killing Uthman. And then the tension was, did Ali, as fourth caliph, sufficiently prosecute the capture and trial of that person? So that was the tension that came in there. There are many Sunnis who will speak not of four rightly guided caliphs, but of five. Because in their understanding, Hassan is the fifth of the rightly guided caliphs and in their understanding he voluntarily relinquishes his his power his caliphate to Ma'awiyah so now you can see again where the story diverges but they would have very definite respect for Hassan as the fifth of the rightly guided caliphs as the grandson of the prophet etc it also has to be said that there are some uh, stories that circulate uh, in some muslim circles about hassan which are not complementary No Muslim is ever going to be happy at the thought of the grandson of the Prophet being massacred by people who claim to be Muslims. So there could never be any rejoicing at Karbala at the day of Ashura. Whether you are Sunni or Shia, this is the grandson of the Prophet. Something has gone horribly wrong, the Sunnis would say. Something has gone horribly wrong within the body, the Ummah. Those who proclaim themselves to be Muslims, those who proclaim themselves to be the leaders of that community, are responsible for the death, for the murder of the grandson of the Prophet, not even 50 years after his own death. Something has gone horribly wrong. The sixth Imam, Jafar al-Sadiq. Jafar al-Sadiq is regarded by Sunni scholars of fiqh, scholars of Islamic jurisprudence, as being a great teacher a most knowledgeable man and indeed several of the masters of Sunni schools of fiqh people like al-Shafi'i, Abu Hanifa, 
study under Imam Jafar al-Sadiq. So he has a very high reputation within the Sunni scholarly community because of his scholarly nature and because of his command of those issues. One of the great lies which is told is that Sunni and Shia have always hated each other for all ages. This, as you will know, is not true at all. There have been times in history when there have been tensions. There have been many more times in history when Sunni and Shia have lived side by side, sharing the same villages, intermarrying, working together in the same businesses, etc. And here on the scholarly level, Jafar al-Sadiq will be used by Sunni scholars of fiqh as being a great scholar upon whose wisdom they can draw. So this is just a little overview of how they see things. That was the easy one. <laughs> so hard, it's hiding. Somebody asked me if I could just give a quick run through of the division, the split between Sunni and Shia and why it came about. Because we need to remind ourselves of that from various different dimensions. Well, I have to teach this quite often, so I will give you the bare bones of how I present it. And <coughs> that is that I say, the key verse in the Quran is the verse that says, when Allah and his Prophet have decided upon a thing, a faithful man or woman has no choice in the matter but to obey. Because that is the verse that guides both communities. Because sometimes it is spoken about as though a group of people thought that Ali was a better bloke than Abu Bakr. This is just complete nonsense. Sometimes this is talked about as though it were political, grab for power on one side or the other, or that it were the blue shirts versus the red shirts, like a football match. You pick your team. This is completely to belittle the question, because the question hinges on this verse. If God and his messenger have laid down who should be the successor after the prophet, you have no choice but to obey if you are a faithful Muslim. So from the Shia perspective, we know that there are verses in the Quran which are interpreted to mean it was the clear designation of God in the Quran to say that Ali should be the successor. And the most famous verse is the verse of the ring. When the Quran says, the Wali, I translate Wali as being the guardian with authority. The guardian with authority of my community is Allah, Everybody agrees. The Prophet, everybody agrees. And then the one who gives in charity whilst continuing to bow in prayer. That's the phrase on which there is division. Because from the Shia perspective, this verse was revealed at the time, the occasion of revelation, as we say, the verse is revealed at a time there is a beggar who comes into the mosque. People are doing voluntary prayers. He goes around looking for alms. He approaches Imam Ali. Imam Ali is in Raku. And he holds out his hand and points to the ring on his finger. Take the ring as alms. The one who gives in charity whilst continuing to bow in prayer. Therefore, the Shia tradition understands that as a divine designation of Ali. 
and according to the Shia Tafsir, they approached the Prophet and they said, explain this verse to us, to whom does it apply? And he said, it applies to Ali. End of conversation. So from a Shia perspective, there's the verse. The Sunnis, they regard that verse as not regarding one individual, but as anyone. So authority lies in the hand of those who are charitable and continue in prayer. Alas. And then we have the, the hadith that we know well, the hadith of the early calling together the family of the Prophet. Ali is declared to be the Wali of Muhammad. We have the Khadiyahum. Therefore, Ali is proclaimed by the Prophet on divine authority to be his successor. <coughs> the Sunnis have those same events in their books. They interpret them differently. Therefore, you have a division. And finally, the Hadith of the two most precious things. I will leave after me two most precious things that is the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt, that hadith in the Sunni collections reads differently. I will leave after me two most precious things, the Quran and my Sunnah. So now we have the basis for division. Now, if you are a Shia, you have no choice in the matter. God has already designated Ali as the successor. End of conversation. If you are a Sunni, God and his messenger have not declared who should be the successor. Therefore, it's up to us, the community, to sort it out amongst ourselves. And that's why, whilst the prophet has I mean, is, is within a very short period of time after his death. Ali is preparing for the funeral. The heads of clans, we can call them, the leaders amongst the community, get together and they hold a clan chief shura. And they sort it out amongst themselves. Abu Bakr should be the leader. And that's how they get Abu Bakr. And then he's put to the people, and those people who are present give their assent. Now, there are, of course, those people who don't agree, and they rather are wanting to support the claim of Ali, a successor. Quickly, just pushing through this, after... Now, from the Shia perspective, the succession becomes very clear because we have infallible designation from one Imam to the next and they must all come from the Ahl al-Bayt, that is, they must be the blood descendants from Ali and Fatima. From the Sunni perspective, we have the Hadith, which is there in the Sunni collections, that says, even if he be a black Abyssinian slave, if he be the most pious and wise amongst you, he should be your leader. Now, black Abyssinian slave, that's as far down the social order as you can get. So the quality of the leader, who will become called the Caliph, the quality of the caliph is the one who is most pious and wise. Who should decide? We should decide, the community. So, after Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr knows there could be chaos in the camp again. So he nominates his successor. And when he dies, people proclaim, Abu Bakr said that it should be Umar. What do you say? And amongst the people, if it's good enough for Abu Bakr, it's good enough for us. 
It's a it's a clan chief dominated society. Don't forget. Umar stacks the deck. He creates uh, an electoral college, as we would say. He nominates six people who are to sort it out amongst themselves. One of them is Ali. Now, one of the preconditions of this shura is they decide whoever it should be must agree before we nominate them that they will implement not only the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet but also the Sunnah of Abu Bakr and of Umar. And Ali says, whoa, steady on lads. I am not prepared to follow the example of those two. Quran, Prophet, fine. Abu Bakr, Umar, no. Because, again, in sheer understanding, certain fundamental things have been changed by the first two caliphs, and therefore we're not going to follow them. That's how we end up with Uthman. Because Uthman is prepared to do it. So that's the way then that the split is developing. And you could say that when Ali becomes the fourth caliph and the first imam, there's a chance that things could have come back together. So the final division, you could say, occurs at the time of Imam Hassan because there is a group amongst the leaders of the community who say anybody but the son of Ali because that's going to set up a blood succession like a monarchy and at that point the split actually takes place and it is from the year 661 the death of Imam Ali that we date the first Caliphate, the first dynasty, the Umayyads, and all Muslim schools, both Sunni and Shia, regard the Umayyads as being an incredibly corrupt leadership. They took the money and they used it for their own ends. They did not follow the guidance of Quran and Sunnah. They did not live according to the Sharia. They were a right shower. And that's really where the division comes about. And it is so bad that the, the two groups in Baghdad, the Abbasids and the Alids, the, the followers of Ali, the Alids, they want to do something about it. And of course, it's the Abbasids who drive through the middle. They get rid of the Umayyads and they establish another dynasty that becomes the Abbasid dynasty, and that goes from 750 up until 1258. Not, of course, a universal dynasty, as the children of the Fatimids know well. And there, Madame is giving a smile, mm -hmm. which means I should go. <laughs> If there are more questions and we have more time tomorrow night, I might even get another try. <laughs> Thank you. Hussein Karbala Martin Majlis. When these words echo from the walls of our mosque, a lady in black hijab joins us. She is Bibi Fatima. She watches us, she cries with us, she collects our tears. Cry. Cry for Hussein. <coughs> Inshallah, our tears will not be wasted. Our tears for Hussein will become our weapons against the hardship in our grave and on the day of judgment. Hussein is in Karbala. 
He hardly has 72 men with him. They are, all, they are not all grown up adults. Some of Hussein's men are children. On and Muhammad, Bibi Zainab's young sons are there. On is only 13 years old, Muhammad is only 11 years old. Tonight is the night of these two children, On Muhammad. First, let us send our greetings to those mothers of Karbala who sacrificed their children for Islam. Lucky are those mothers of Karbala whose children willingly and happily sacrificed their young lives for Islam. Tonight, let us first comfort those mothers of Karbala who are proud to sacrifice their children for Islam. Mothers of Karbala, mother of An Muhammad, Bibi Zainab, mother of Qasim, Omer Farwa, mother of Ali Akbar, Omer Layla, mother of Ali Asghar, Omer Rubab. Mothers of Karbala were proud of their children. They loved their children. Of course, like any mother, they had a, they had the heart of a mother. A mother loves her children the most. Why then? Did the mothers of Karbala let their children die in Karbala? They knew Hussein was on the right path. They knew their sacrifice would help save Islam and us from the fire of hell. Mothers of Karbala squashed their motherly love and sacrificed their children for Hussein, for Islam. How can we, the Husseini, ever forget those mothers of Karbala? Why shouldn't we cry and do martyr for the mothers of Karbala and their children, on Muhammad, Qasim, Ali Akbar and Ali Asghar? Majlis al Karbala will never die. Martim al Karbala will never die. Yazids of yesterday have failed to stop it. Yazids of today will not be able to stop it. Yazids of tomorrow may try thousands of times to crush it, but Majlis al Hussein, Martim al Karbala will never die. Allah Himself has promised to keep the name of Hussein alive till the day of judgment. Let us now focus our mind on Karbala. Days and nights of Muharram unfolded on the land of Karbala. The night of the night of Muharram came. Ashura, night of a very tragic night and the last night of the martyrs of Karbala. No one in Hussein's camp slept on Ashura night. Men spent the whole night praying, reciting duas and the Holy Quran. Mothers of Karbala were preparing their children. The next day was Ashura day, the day of the battle of Karbala. What were the mothers telling, telling their children? To be careful, to hide and save their lives? No, they were telling their children to sacrifice their lives. They were telling them to die. Didn't they love their children? Of course they did. They had the heart of their mother. They were proud of their children. They loved their children very much. Then why were they telling their children to sacrifice their lives, to die? Because they knew Hussein was on the right path. Because their sacrifice would save Islam because Allah would be pleased with them. Now let us listen to what the mothers of Karbala were telling their children on the night of Ashura. Umar Layla is with her son, Ali Akbar. My darling son, Ali Akbar, tomorrow is the day of the battle. My son, Ali Akbar, remember your life is not more important than the life of your father. Your father's life will be in danger tomorrow. My darling, don't hesitate to give your life to protect your father's life. Oh no, Rubab is with her baby, Ali Asghar. My baby Asghar, I wish you were a young man. I wish have sacrificed your life to save your father's life. Umar Farwa is with her son, Qasim. Qasim, my, my son, my darling, if your father was alive today, he, he would have sacrificed his life first. My darling, don't embarrass me in front of your father on the day of judgment. Qasim, my son, do not hesitate to sacrifice your life to protect your uncle's life. Umar Kalasum, Imam Hussein's sister was sitting alone weeping. Abbas, her brother, heard her crying. He came to the tent. My sister, Kalasum, why are you crying? What's the matter? Abbas, tomorrow is the day of sacrifice. I have no children to sacrifice. My sister, Kalasum, don't cry. Abbas is still alive. Tomorrow I will sacrifice my life as a gift on your behalf. I will be your sacrifice. Bibi Zainab is with her two sons. Sons on Muhammad. My sons on Muhammad. Today, tomorrow is the day of the battle. Your uncle Hussein's life will be in danger. 
My darlings, if anything happened to Uncle Hussein while you are still alive, I will be filled with shame. My on Muhammad, my on Muhammad, I will not be able to face your grandmother, Bibi Fatima, on the day of judgment. Please, my dear sons, don't let me down. Be the first ones to sacrifice your lives. Ashura came. Ali Akbar gave the azan. Imam Hussein led the Fajr prayers. The day was already very hot. The battle began. Imam Hussein's army of 72 thirsty and hungry men against 20,000 of Yazid's men. Fur went to the battlefield and was martyred by Yazid's beast. One by one, Hussein's companions went to the battlefield and were killed. <coughs> Since dawn, <coughs> Bibi Zainab was watching the bodies being brought to the tent one by one. She called her son, On Muhammad, my sons, what are you waiting for? Why have you not been to the battlefield yet? Go and fight the enemies of Islam. Mother, since dawn, we have been to Uncle Hussein many times for permission to fight. He keeps refusing us. <coughs> Mother, you help us. Uh, ask uh, Uncle Hussein to give us permission to fight jihad. Bibi Zainab called her brother Hussein to her tent. Brother Hussein, I have been like a mother to you, haven't I? Hussein, your mother is begging you to let on Muhammad go to the battlefield. Zainab, my sister, jihad is not wajib on children. How can I let my sister's son be killed while I am still alive? No, Zainab, no. Hussein, my brother, if Ali Akbar dies before on Muhammad, how will I be able to face our mother on the day of judgment? My brother, I will be filled with shame. Please, brother, let them go. Hussein saw the disappointment on Zainab's face. Her eyes were filled with tears. Hussein put his arm around on Muhammad <coughs> and, led them to the, and led them to the horses. He kissed them and helped them mount their horses. Go. Go and show those beastly men that you have the blood of Jafar and Ali in your veins. On Muhammad looked at their mother and said, Fi aman Allah, mother. Fi aman Allah, mother. Fi aman Allah, my sons. On Muhammad rode on the battlefield. They fought bravely together. They were the grandsons of Jafar and Ali. They, pu they pushed their enemies back. Hundreds of Yazid's men were killed. Abbas and Hussein watched the two brothers fight so fiercely despite being thirsty for three days. Abbas, who had trained on Muhammad in the art of sword fighting, was filled with pride. Umar Saad, Yazid's commander, got worried. He ordered his soldiers to separate the two brothers and then attack them from all sides. On Muhammad was separated. Each one was then surrounded by Yazid's soldiers. The two brothers were attacked by horsemen running from one side to another. On Muhammad were attacked with arrows, swords, spears and daggers from all sides. How much can two young children, thirsty and hungry, for three days take? As they fell, they called out for their uncle. Uncle, come quickly, uncle, come and help us. Hussein and Abbas rushed to the battlefield. The children were severely wounded. They were taking their last breath. Uncle, give our salam to our mother. Uncle, please tell our mother that just as she told us, we did not go towards the river. Imam Hussain and Abbas carried the two young bodies to the tent. Ali Akbar cried out, My brothers, on Muhammad have been killed. <coughs> Zainab heard the cry from her tent. She did not cry. She laid her masala and, and performed sajda. Ya Allah, I thank you for accepting my sacrifice. Ya Allah, I am proud of my two sons who have given their lives for Islam. On Muhammad's bodies were laid on the floor. The ladies gathered around it. They cried and did matam. Ya Anna Ya Muhammada, Ya Anna Ya Muhammada. Zainab did not cry. She did not do matam for On Muhammad. Inna lillahi wa inna illa raji'un. We are from Allah and to him we will return. <coughs> Maybe.